There is a single question at the bottom of physics, of chemistry, and of every scientific discipline in between. It takes into consideration every possible natural phenomenon of the universe, from the physics of water droplets to the chemistry behind color, from the behavior of atoms to the formation of black holes. In this video, we will explore where this question even came from, what the possible answers are, if there are any, and what those answers reveal about the nature of humanity. But in order to understand the nature of such a task, we have to ask ourselves one simple question. What is a second? Here I have with me a piece of cesium-133, or at least something that looks like it because I can't actually afford it. Today, if you Google the length of a second, you'll stumble across this answer. One second is the time that elapses during about this many cycles of radiation produced by the transition between two levels of the cesium-133 atom. Cesium is actually the element used to make one of these boys, atomic clocks, and for good reason. If you were to start one of these 150 million years in the past, back to when the Stegosaurus existed, and started running one of these clocks, that clock today would be off by one second. This thing, that's how accurate this little thing is. Like, what the heck, man? But the problem with this definition of a second is that we've been using the second in calculations and measurements for a lot longer than we even knew cesium existed. So what was the original definition? The origins of the second trace back to the 1000 AD by the Persian scholar al biruni But he defined the second based on the fact that the day, the time it takes for the sun to pass the same point in the sky twice, is 24 hours long. Well, why 24? That's because the ancient Egyptians divided the day into two 12-hour parts. Well, why 12? And eventually, after wondering how you even got this far, you find what you think is the end of the rabbit hole. At around 3500 BC, the ancient Sumerians, who at the time lived in modern-day Iraq, devised the sexagesimal math system that was based around the number 60 and 360, which probably came from the year, which is how long it takes for the sun to climb up and climb back down the sky back to the same place. Okay, that was a lot of info, let's just climb out of the rabbit hole for a second. One second got its definition and meaning from how long one year is. But hear me out. What if the Earth were a little closer to the Sun? What if the Sun were a little smaller? Would we still use the base 60 system? And in turn, would a second still be a second long? So isn't there a little bit of chance to it all? A bit of randomness? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe. Okay, look, we all know the story of Isaac Newton. In 1660, an apple fell on his head, and with a few strokes of human genius, he was able to derive his three laws of motion. However, there is a fourth theory that doesn't get as much attention, but is still crucial to the way that we understand the universe, is universal law of gravitation. Imagine you're on a flat field, and you try to jump up. The reason why you don't fly away into the stratosphere is because of Earth's gravity pulling you back down. What Newton realized was that gravity is also the force that keeps the sun in orbit around the sun. But how could two completely different types of motion, one in which you almost move in a straight line, while another in which the Earth moves in almost a circle, both be caused by gravity? So Newton devised an equation and theory to explain this. It basically says that as either of the two objects get heavier, then the gravitational pull between them must get stronger by the same proportion. And if the two objects are farther away from each other, then the gravity gets weaker by an even greater proportion. But there was a problem with this theory, and Newton knew this. If Newton had two hypothetical planets that were a meter apart from each other, and each weighed one kilogram, then the gravitational force between them would not be one Newton. It would be way less than that. Otherwise, the gravitational force between you and the chair would be so strong that you physically would not be able to get out of it. So, on the right side of the equation, there has to be a number, a universal constant, that makes this equation true. But by this point, Newton was focusing on other things, and he died in 1727 with that mystery unsolved. 51 years later, however, it was finally discovered. And the most interesting part about it is that it was almost completely by accident.
18th century English physicist Henry Cavendish was an interesting man, to say the least. He didn't really care about the world around him except through his scientific lens, and he barely published any of his work. And the work that he did publish is unique, to say the least. In 1776, he published three separate papers on factitious airs, including flammable air, which we now know as hydrogen. He was also one of the many scientists trying to find the elusive phlogiston, a uh, hypothetical element that was supposedly responsible for all combustion reactions, like the explosion that happens when you burn something like me methane gas. Clearly, science has changed a lot since then. But I can't lie, Cavendish was pretty smart because of how he was able to calculate the mass of the Earth and, in turn, find G. Let me show you how he pulled this off. Imagine that you have a large box. Hanging from the ceiling of the box is a wire connected to a tight horizontal string with two heavy lead balls on each end. From a lower horizontal string hang two smaller lead balls fixed in place. Of course, there were various machines that Cavendish used to control the position of the large balls and look at the equipment from the outside of the box. Now, the reason why Cavendish needed this box is the same reason why you can actually stand up from your chair right now. The large lead balls, because of their gravitational pull on each other, would be very weakly attracted to the other. And I, I mean the force is as small as 1 in 50 millionth of the force that the Earth would exert on the balls. Wait, wait, can we stop for a second just to appreciate that? Cavendish was able to create an experiment in the 1700s that could detect a force equivalent to that of an earthworm pushing against a wall. Any slight gust of wind or maybe even a breath near the apparatus could completely mess up calculations. I mean, that's dedication right there. Anyways, the large lead balls would ever so slightly, because of their gravitational pull towards each other, s speed up until they collided with the small lead balls. By measuring various aspects of the experiment, like the distance covered by the large balls combined with some clever math, Cavendish was able to calculate the mass of the Earth. But wait a second. Look at the equation for the law of gravitation. We have the masses of two objects attracted towards each other, the radius of the distance between the objects, and the gravitational force between the objects. Without even realizing it, Cavendish gave us all we needed to calculate the value of G. If you'd like a more detailed explanation of this experiment, I highly recommend checking out this video right here. And there it is, that's the gravitational constant, one of the fundamental constants that controls everything that could possibly happen in the universe period, from the motion of falling objects to the orbit of planets. For the next 150 years, this single number served as the foundation for modern physics and astrophysics. And to this day, Newton's classical theory still gives very accurate descriptions of how gravity works. But there is still something deeply mysterious about this number, and it puts into question the existence of the universe. And in 1961, that question was shoved into the limelight. Before he turned 30, American physicist Robert H. Dick was already changing the world. In 1944, as a scientist at MIT, he developed the microwave radiometer, a tool that was later used to discover the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMBR, the strongest evidence to date proving that the universe is expanding. However, by the 1960s, Dick also began to become increasingly interested in gravity. He started to tinker with a paradoxical idea that because the universe is expanding, the gravitational constant may not be constant at all. And as he began to work with the constant G, he began to notice something strange about it. This is the most complete and precise valuation of G that we have right now. But doesn't this number seem kind of random? There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's like the universe took out its all-powerful keyboard and just slapped a few numbers down and called it the gravitational constant. But okay, maybe it's just this constant. What about the other ones? What about Planck's constant, the number that relates a photon's energy level to its wavelength? What about the mass of an electron, the speed of light in a vacuum? They all look like this. And now here's the question, the single question at the bottom of the universe. Why are they like this? Perhaps the most well-known theory to answer this question is known as the fine-tuned argument. And it's pretty self-explanatory. 
Imagine you have a universal dial, and one complete revolution traveled around the dial is equal to the value of a certain universal constant. Let's take G for example. If you were to divide this dial into 10 to the 60th parts, then slightly tweak the dial to the left or right by a single part, gravity would be either too strong or too weak. And since gravity holds big bodies of matter together, like stars, the universe would either expand too quickly for any life to exist, or crunch back down into a singularity. That is all that is keeping us from the end. From literal nothingness. Everything we know is literally balancing on a universally small pinhead. And this same logic applies to every single other physical constant in the universe. One slight change, and it's not just Cavendish's experiment that's gonna change this time. And yet, here you are, against seemingly impossible odds. Because of this, scientists like Robert Dick thought to themselves, how the heck did this happen? And to answer that, Dick proposed the fine-tuned argument, that the universe is finely tuned for life. Okay, but that doesn't really explain the reason as to why these constants exist. The universe is not alive, it doesn't have feelings, and it sure as heck doesn't care about life. So there has to be something else behind this. And as of today, the fine-tuned argument has three potential solutions. One, we live in a multiverse. Somehow, multiple universes, perhaps an infinite number of them, are being born, each with randomized universal constants. Many of them, maybe even most of them, don't have the conditions suitable for life. But just by pure, infinitesimally small or infinitesimally large chance, depending on how you look at it, this universe happened to be the one. Two, there is a designer, this almighty creator, that finally tuned the physical constants for us. This is where religion comes into play. Three, there was no other option. Life has to exist. There is no other way. So which one is the best? Which one has the highest chance of being true? Well, I guess that's up to you. After all, it's not like we can prove any of these with a big enough lab. But there is a profound flaw to each of these three solutions. And it's not actually about the logic behind the solutions themselves. It's about the logic that many great scientists like Robert Dick used to come up with these solutions in the first place. And it has to do with the fact that a second is a second long. The length of a second, the mass of the kilogram, all of these units of measurements are human inventions. They're tools that we use to measure time, mass, and everything else that this universe has in store. And that includes calculating a physical constant. For example, if we decided that we didn't want to use the base 60 system that the Sumerians used, the value of G would look very different from it is today. So maybe the universe is fine-tuned for life. But we can't use that to explain the value for G or the mass of an electron or any other universal constant that we have calculated. Because simply put, the universe doesn't revolve around us. It doesn't care about how we do science or interpret the way that the universe works. The universe is just the universe and all the constants are just constants. And that's the problem with this argument. We collectively as humans, these combinations of nitrogen and oxygen and carbon have the arrogance to think that our tools to understand the world and the universe that we live in dictate the actual constants of the universe. We're just humans floating on a rock in the middle of nowhere trying to figure out where we are and why we're here. But maybe that's what makes us all special. The fact that we're alive, the fact that we know we exist. So, and I mean, we all are from the Big Bang. So as astrophysicist Brian Cox once put it, we are the universe exploring itself and we're making poetry and music along the way. At the very least, we're all trying our best.